uh, ignore my, uh, my glamorous assistants here. Don't worry about them. That's my job. I'm their father. Uh, we'll come to them in due course. Right. <laughs> can I see the audience? I can. Who here is looking for a job? Come on, you're all MBA students, or most of you are. Hands up. Who is looking for a job in financial services or has a job in financial services? Don't be frightened. Don't be shy. I'm going to put my hand up as well. I have one. Okay, so financial services. Why financial services? I mean, I was in your position 14 years ago because I went to a certain well-known business school whose name really can't be mentioned on stage given the fact we're in Cambridge. <laughs> so thank you for letting me come here, Cambridge, to speak. But why financial services? Why do you want to be in financial services? Why did I want to be in financial services? Well, bluntly, at the time, it was about the money. So who else here is of the belief or is interested in the money that exists in financial services? Again, don't be shy. I was interested in it. So the money. People go there because there's a lot of... Is this me that's making this noise? Nope. Um, you want to go there because there's money in financial services. But how much? So you think about financial services, you think about investment banking, you think about the, the role of financial services, and what you start to think of are investment banking salaries. Well, let me tell you that investment banking salaries are not really where it's at. Currently, investment banking is going through a slump. Um, jobs in investment banking are pretty few and far between. The whole M&A cycle is going through a, a dip. So if you want to have a job in financial services in investment banking, yes, you will have a good job that pays well, but you'll only have it for three to five years. Because every three to five years, there's a hiring freeze and a firing a massive firing. If you want to have a job in financial services, can I recommend asset management? So let me ask you a question. How much do you think, on average, a broker, investment banker, is paid? If you look at the total compensation pool of a financial services firm and divide it by the total number of employees, who thinks the salary of an investment banker is in excess, on average, across all of those people, including secretaries, support staff, catering, is more than £100,000? Anyone? More than 100,000 pounds. With or without bonuses? With bonuses. OK. Not, not big um, uh, equity bonuses, just cash bonuses. So more than 100,000 pounds. Who thinks it's more than 150,000 pounds? Anyone? On average, across all of the whole of the investment bank, who thinks it's more than 180,000 pounds? Hardly anyone. It is about 180,000 pounds across the whole of this. Um, whole of the portfolio of jobs that you can have in an investment bank. Let me tell you that asset managers earn £225,000 on average, and they don't fire. So top tip, if you're interested in money, and in having that money over an extended period of time, work for an asset manager, because they don't fire. So I had a lot of things. I have a, a good perspective on earnings in different sectors and earnings in different places. So I've been a researcher. I have a PhD. I've been a police officer. I was a police officer for seven years. I was a financial analyst. I've been a partner in a consulting firm. I've been the managing director of a global bank. I'm now the managing director of a non-profit organization looking at research into the sector. And also, incidentally, and most recently, and much to the chagrin of a lot of people I know, a professor. I like that. I like to, call, I like to make sure that people I don't like have to call me professor. It's quite cool. And really, it's, there's no other role involved in it. I don't have to teach and don't have to do research, but I get to call myself professor. I sent an email out to some people I didn't like saying, just so you know, I haven't changed my email address. You can still catch me at the same, uh, the same details, the same phone number, Professor Christopher C. <laughs> it was great. I got a lot of obnoxious replies back, but it was really good fun. <laughs> Sorry, that's just me. <sighs> so what made me think about this money? You'd think that for all of that money, £225,000, there'd be a lot of value add, wouldn't you? You'd think to be paid £225,000, there would be significant value add. Let me give you a little case study. I went from being a police officer to being a financial analyst. When I was a police sergeant in Edinburgh, I had full responsibility, life, death, care, of about 50 police officers, and vicarious responsibility of something like 100 to 150,000 people. I was paid 25,000 pounds a year to do this. I left the police, moved to London, got a job with an investment bank, and within two months, I was paid 40,000 pounds for shuffling pieces of paper around and checking two columns of numbers. Actually, it was a job that actually either Rosie or Eric could have done as well. It really was no more than comparing two columns of numbers, and I was paid 40,000 pounds plus bonus for doing this. I could not understand why, and I still can't. 
So it got me asking some questions. Where is the value? Because if £225,000 is what an asset manager is paid, £185,000 is what a broker is paid, the oil and gas sector, if you do the same numbers, and I've done some research on this, is about £150,000. The automotive sector is £100,000. The retail sector, Tesco's, Waitrose, about £30,000. So they must add some significant value to give £225,000, and you would be wrong in that. So I first started looking at this eight years ago, and eight years ago I did a piece of research for uh, Biz and for the Treasury, which looked at the cost to invest in a retail fund. Who here owns an ISA? ISAs. I think they're good value, right? ISAs? What is the headline cost of an ISA? It's about as expressed as a percentage of assets. It's about 1%. That's what you get told. The research that I did showed that for an equity ISA, you probably pay in the round with implicit charges, all kinds of other fees, more like 3 to 4.5% of assets. This means that every year, 3 to 4.5% of your assets are eaten up by the intermediaries. I'm going to go give you an example of that with the kids in a minute. 3 to 4.5%, but think about what that means. In a market that you're investing in, which has, over the long term, growth of no more than 5%, that's the FTSE, 4% to 5%. If that return is immediately eaten up by all of the intermediaries plus inflation, you get zero return. So it came as no surprise to me when I did my research that I found people who had been putting money in for a decade who had exactly the same amount of money in their funds as they'd put in, less inflation. It was unexplainable. How, how could this happen? And I got chastised heavily by the industry, the financial services industry, for putting this research out there. It was published in The Guardian. It got leaked by somebody in the Treasury, and that's fine. That's fine and dandy. I don't mind. But what got me was, when I was being shouted at by the industry for ruining a fragile savings culture, they said something important to me. Why are you looking at the retail financial management sector? Why? It's the smallest part of the industry. Okay, good. There's a bigger prize out there. There's a bigger piece. And that bigger piece is the pension fund industry, and why is that important? So really what I'm here to do is talk to you today about pension funds. I bet you're excited now, aren't you? <laughs> Who here has a pension fund? Who here wants a pension fund? Okay, so that pretty much covers all of you. You need a pension fund, but not as it exists currently. I have a real problem with pension funds currently. Pension funds have a peculiar property to them. Pension funds, life funds, our savings have a peculiar property to them. In the UK, there are six to seven trillion pounds of savings out there in a pension fund or an institutional fund of some kind or other. How big is that number? What's the market capitalization of the FTSE? Anybody? All listed equities in the UK. The ownership of every single big company, small company in the UK adds up to two and a half trillion pounds. So we own all of that two and a half times over. You, 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 me. We own everything, absolutely everything. So if we're going to figure out this journey of understanding how this complex industry pays itself, why it pays itself so much, the justification for all of its cost and expense, we want to look where most of this value lies. And sadly, that means pension funds. And it means like people like I, like myself, have to get involved in what is ostensibly a very, very deep and deeply dull and boring topic to almost everybody, but is the most important topic that you will consider right now and for the next 25 years of your lives. If you haven't sat down and looked at your pension fund and thought, how does it work? Why am I paying this? How much do they get paid? And if your pension fund isn't performing, you sit there and think to yourself, why am I paying that person on average £225,000 per year? I only own 40. Then you are stupid. Just as I was stupid. Just as everybody was stupid who hasn't asked these questions. And this is the curiosity part of my talk. Why are we not curious about this problem? It's enormous. In the States, there are 30 to $40 trillion worth of pension funds. And yet the market capitalization of all of the listed equities in the American markets is shy of 20 trillion. Again, we own everything. We own everything, and we don't ask 
how this money is looked after and how it's cared for. Why not? It's because it's complex and it's because it's opaque. So this is where the kids come in. Step forward, please, Rosie and Eric. <laughs> Eric, come over this side, please. Yeah, yeah, come on, give a round of applause. I, I, was, I was tempted, so tempted, to just let them walk out on stage and leave them hanging. That would have been awesome. <laughs> right, OK, so I am Financial Services. And I'm going to ask Eric here to give some money to Rosie through me. Eric, please would you give me the money? Turn around and face the other way, please. Rosie, that's for you. Are you happy? Yeah. Why are you happy? Because you got some money, right? Hey, it's cool. You had none to start with. Let's do that again. Face each other, please. Face each other. Eric, please give me the money again. Thank you. There we go, Rosie. Are you happy? Are you sure? Look what I took. Are you sure? You want this? Yeah, you, I took half of it, didn't I? How, how do you feel about that? You're not happy, are you? <laughs> no, you're not, right. There you go, you can keep those two. Thank you, over there. Now, the point here is... <laughs> oh, Rosie, Rosie, come forwards, come forwards, come forwards. That's it, that's right, that's no, that's fine. So, the point here is that I took half of the money. Now, you might think that's an exaggerated example. It is not an exaggeration. Think about the impact of compounding. Stop playing with the money, keep it, put it in your pocket. <laughs> It's a gift. It's just, oh, okay, fair enough. Give it to your brother. That's exactly what you need to do. <laughs> Bribe him. So this is exactly what happens. And the example I'm going to give you is with British Home Stores. Who knows the story of British Home Stores? It's been in the press recently. There's an inquiry out about the collapse of British Home Stores. Now, regardless of the business model of British Home Stores, it's an old-style retail firm in the UK which was always going to get outcompeted by the likes of Amazon and eBay and so on and so forth, it still has assets of value. In fact, Philip Green sold it to the next buyer for one pound only, and they bought it willingly. They're trying to sell it for one pound now, and no one wants to buy it. Do you know why? 207 million pounds worth of liabilities on the pension fund. Do you know what I mean by that when I say 207 million pounds worth of shortfall in liabilities? What I mean is that the future, if you stop the pension fund right now and allow no more new members, the total value and current present value terms, come on, who's doing uh, Tim Morrison's uh, course on finance at the side business school? The present value of all of those liabilities into the future in present value is 642 million pounds. But there's only 435 million pounds in the pot. They haven't got enough money by 207 million pounds or 33%. 33% of the assets have disappeared. And do you know that's not even a, by, in isolation? That's not an isolated number. Eric, what was the piece of paper I gave you now? It's a Times article. Take it out of your pocket. How many pension funds are there in the UK? You can remember it. 6,000. How many of them... <laughs> this is because I can't remember numbers on stage. How many of them, the second number, yeah. how many of them have a shortfall in funding? 5,000. What is the total value of that shortfall? 355 billion. 355 billion pounds, people. <laughs> Not 207 million, 355 billion. Whose responsibility is that 355 billion? <laughs> Shareholders. <coughs> Happy? If you're the government, the government has one group of pension funds called the Local Government Pension Schemes. It has 250 billion of assets under management. It's got a shortfall of funding of about 60 billion pounds. So the government is on the hook for 60 billion pounds of the liabilities. What is the national deficit currently? 75 billion. You can't escape from the fact that that 60 billion pounds of liabilities adds to the national deficit. So George Osborne is not managing a 75 billion pound deficit. He's managing 140 billion pounds of deficit. So you think what austerity has done to the UK in the past five years. He's got to double it to be able to make up that shortfall. Happy? I'm not happy. So where does this money go? How can we recoup it? And this is the clever part. If you don't know how much you're paying, how can you manage your costs? And this is the curiosity part. This is the bit that gets me. 
We live in a world whereby we inquire, uh, there is a dialogue that we have for every purchasing decision that we make which has costs at the center of it. Has anybody bought anything here, anything here, without first looking at the label? Really? Does everybody here look at the label when they buy things? Put your hands up if you, if you do. Everybody put your hands down because you're all wrong. Have you ever bought a financial services product without knowing what the proper cost was? Have you ever sat there in front of a financial advisor and said, OK, so fine, there's this little cost here, but what other costs are there? Oh, don't worry about those. They're negligible. We suspend disbelief for all financial services products, and they take us to the cleaners. The total value for um, BHS, British Home Steals, my research shows me that pension funds routinely cost not the 30 basis points, 0.3%, that they tell you they cost, or they tell the trustees they cost, it's more like 2%. So that's a factor of seven or eight larger than we expect. And when no one ever asks any questions about this. Imagine if we could claw that back. How quickly would we fill up 207 billion pounds? I'll tell you, about 10 years, by doing nothing more than negotiating on cost. Simple economics. Simple business practice, you're all MBA students. Why don't you get out there and negotiate on behalf of all the consumers, please. Transparency and negotiation, it's pretty simple stuff. Thank you. <laughs>